Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome as we launch the 2021 Spotlight Series of Discussions with Young People. I'm Buffy Higgins Beard, CEO to Award USA, and we welcome you from around the globe as the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award offices in the US, Canada, and our global foundation present young people and climate action. We wanna frame out why the challenges facing this and future generations is the focus of a year long series. There's absolutely no denying that the world of today is drastically changing. For those growing up within it, this creates exciting opportunities and plenty of challenge. As the globe comes together this week at the United Nations COP26, they continue to work towards the 17 sustainable development goals these are sometimes called the global goals. They're a collection of independent and interconnected markers designed to give us all a healthier future and a better planet with targets geared towards 2030. The spotlight session today and those scheduled for the remainder of 21 and into 2022 are gonna to bring together a range of voices talking about this. We want to be part of the hashtag decade for action and we want to be sure that we are showing and sharing with you young people who are taking a lead in so many arenas. We celebrate their efforts and we're excited to launch today. The panelists involved are thought leaders, they're activists, and they've helped design the questions that will be asked. We also want this to be interactive. So I'm going to encourage you to use that Q&A, the question and answer button in Zoom. We will not be monitoring chat for questions. And now I'd like to introduce Victoria Solano, Director of Development and Fundraising at the Duke of Ed in Canada. Thanks, Buffy. So as we gather today virtually from across the globe, we want to take a moment to reflect and acknowledge the land on which we all reside. For centuries, the land on which we live has been cared for by Indigenous peoples and or your ancestors. So let us pause and acknowledge their footsteps and thank them for caring for these shared lands, both in the past and in the present. We cannot have an authentic dialogue about climate change without honoring Indigenous peoples and ancestors for their historic and continued care for our planet. As a global organization, we are committed to engaging in purposeful conversations that will ensure all young people have the opportunity to elevate themselves through the award and benefit from the experiential learning and development it fosters. Through this spotlight series, we are creating a space that elevates the voices of young people and discusses solutions on issues that matter to them and will impact their future. The award is committed to ensuring that young people have the skills and opportunities to support the causes that are most important to them. Participants who are passionate about topics such as environment, climate change, biodiversity, can use their individual award program to offer voluntary service, develop their skills, but also experience nature and different environments through their adventurous journey and gold project. The Duke of Edinburgh's International Award is a neutral and adaptable tool that can be used by communities all across the globe. We understand it's our responsibility as an organization to locate and reach out to and work with diverse communities to ensure that young people from all backgrounds and life circumstances are equipped to succeed in life. Together, we can build a future where young people's voices are empowered and provide the platform, which not only showcases that they are the drivers on the road, but they are building a better future and world by 2030. To frame out and moderate our discussion, we're lucky to have Francisca Martinez here, Deputy Chief of Staff to the University of Southern California Schwarzenegger Institute, who helps lead the Institute's climate initiatives and who will now tell us a bit more about COP26. Welcome, Francisca. Thank you, Elizabeth and Victoria for the wonderful introduction and for the um, invitation to participate in today's event. I'm actually joining from California, Southern California. So um, I know we have people from all over the world. So I just wanna take a moment to first welcome you. 
um, and thank you for, for allowing me to speak to you on this platform. Um, I love that the award spotlights the amazing work that so many young people are doing all over the world in different areas. And I'm very um, excited for today's uh, panel discussion that is young people and climate action. As we know, um, young people will bear the biggest burden of climate change. And I'm very inspired to see that they're taking action into their own hands and they're not waiting, you know, for leaders to do, um, to do their work. They're going out into the field and just um, doing it themselves. So I'm, I'm very inspired by that. And I look forward to hearing everything they have to share today. Um, but before we dive into that discussion, I just want to take a moment um, and take a step back just in case there's anyone in the audience that maybe still isn't 100% sure exactly you know, what terms like climate change and global warming mean. Um, one of the most important things that, that I've learned at the Schwarzenegger Institute is that if we want to reach a wider audience, we need to have very effective messaging. And I know sometimes you know, terms like climate change can be a little bit more abstract and a little bit harder to, um, to recognize and identify if you're not working in the field. And so we try to not be so into the weeds on these things and um, really have some effective messaging. And so we like to talk about climate change through the lens of air pollution. Um, I think air pollution is something that anyone, no matter where you are in the world, can understand. Um, and if we understand pollution, we can understand climate change. Uh, when, when we hear stats like 7 million people die from air pollution every year worldwide, you know, that alone should be enough for us to want to act. Um, but then when we think about that same pollution that goes on and, you know, has increased our global average temperatures, which then has increased extreme weather events and created, you know, more intense fire seasons like we see here in California, more extreme heat days, which we see here as well and all over the world, you know, more intense storms and hurricanes, you name it. You know, we have to do something about it. Um, and the goal is to limit global warming as much as possible. To do that, uh, we'll have to reduce drastically reduce our air pollution and limit the amount of, of burning of fossil fuels that we do. But I know that's kind of a lot of doom and gloom. So the good news is that like any man-made problem, um, we have a man-made solution. And I think one of the things that gives me a lot of hope is that most of the technologies that we need um, to reduce air pollution, to address climate change already exist. You know, we're not waiting for a magic pill or an invention that will, you know, magically fix this. Like we have so many resources already, um, but what we need is willpower and people power. And I think we'll, we'll hear a lot about that today. Um, and actually um, this week, the United Nations is hosting their 26 climate change conference, um, which I know Victoria, mentioned, Victoria and Elizabeth mentioned a little bit earlier today. Um, and I'm hopeful that every day, you know, our world comes a little bit closer to, to uniting against that common enemy. But um, this conference, also known as COP26, has gathered leaders from all over the world who have committed and made pledges um, as to how their countries and regions will reduce their emissions um, to limit global warming. And obviously, this is very important. You know, we need leaders to um, set the tone and set the example um, for, for their country. But um, I think, you know, a lot of this are, again, pledges and commitments and the real hard work is back home. Um, it's when countries set policies to hold polluters accountable and reduce emissions. It's when businesses, which I know Jason will speak to a lot of, um, create plans to make their operations greener. Um, and it's when individuals, you know, like ourselves take that action. And, and to me, that last part is actually the most inspiring is um, hearing stories about individuals who didn't wait, you know, for their leaders to commit to X, Y, and Z. You know, they, they've they taken um, things into their own hands. And it's even more inspiring when these leaders are young, you know, younger than me even, who are doing amazing work. Um, and today we'll hear from four amazing trailblazers. Um, some have been, award, you know, part of the award program, um, but they have all been doing great work and I'm very excited to, to hear from them. And so we'll learn about, you know, how they got involved, the work they do, um, their goals for their future and the future of the organizations and how they encourage other young people to get involved. So with that, I'll uh, stop talking. I know I've said a lot, a lot of thoughts, but I really am excited to, uh, to be a part of this discussion. And so um, instead of reading off each one of their impressive bios, I thought it'd be best if 
Um, I'll call on each one of you and you can just tell us where you're from. I know your Zoom name, I'd already say it, um, but since we, you know, we're a worldwide network, it might be good to bring that up. Um, so just tell us where you're working from at the moment, you know, some of the work that you're doing at your organization and what inspired you to get involved in climate action. So I'll start with Brianna. Hi everyone, um, I'm Brianna I'm from Bermuda, currently in Rhode Island for school. Um, what inspired me to get involved in climate action is mainly due to the fact that I live on an island and there wasn't a lot of talk going on about how the ocean itself plays into that. Um, I know through my award, we looked at uh, microplastics and uh, wetland preservations and how we could do look at those on a small scale and then branch out. Um, so through that, I've been able to pick my major. I'm studying marine biology. Um, I've been able to go on different trips uh, through the award and for my skill and voluntary service um, to be able to see how we can create more sustainable ways to go about uh, climate action, specifically pertaining to the ocean. And yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. And speaking of the ocean, I think that might be a good way to now go to Sanjeevan, who I know is also doing a lot of work on, on that. Thanks. Uh, I'm Sanjeevan from the east part of Sri Lanka, and I'm, I'm living next to the ocean, just 50 meters away from the ocean, a part giving oxygen, protein source. Ocean was there as a friend to me to share my experience and you know, emotionally, we were connected. That driven me to work with the ocean towards, uh, like, through the ocean conservation. Like, I'm, I'm supporting this climate action work. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's awesome. And tell us a little bit more about your organization. I know you started Ocean Biome, right? So it'd be yeah. great to hear about that as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm the co-founder of Ocean Biome. I was thinking to speak it a, a bit later, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Ocean Biome is an organization which motivates the upcoming generation to work with ocean and to solve the real problems in the ocean. We are having six main pillars, ocean education, storytelling, community, technology, business, and research. We are, we are like, no, we are building the basic pillars for the organizations. Uh, now 30 plus volunteers are being with me, like, yeah, we are working here. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. And, um, you know, I think when we, when we, picture the ocean, we don't necessarily always imagine that there's like an equity component to that. And I think something that very important that I learned at the Institute as well was that, you know, there's so many young people that have never seen the ocean. And that's just crazy. You know, I, again, I grew up in Southern California, so it's just kind of a natural thing for me, but um, that's just something that I think about a lot, you know, and I love the ocean. I love being out there. Um, and I think there definitely is an equity uh, component to that. So on, you know, on those, along those lines, I'll go over to Madeline, who I know is also doing a lot of work around climate justice and that sort of thing. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Madeline. I was inspired to get involved, you know, both by peers who were already involved, but also I think the reality that climate change isn't just an incoming crisis, um, but one that is already painfully present for many. And I think being exposed to that uh, made me want to take action. I am the US manager for Blue Energy, which is a nonprofit that is working with renewable energy and access to safe drinking water, sanitation, hygiene, and increased food security. And lastly, but not least, let's hear from Jason and the work that you're doing at your organization and also what inspires you to get involved in climate action. Hello everyone, my name is Jason. I use he and his pronouns. I'm currently calling from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, also known colonially known as Vancouver, Canada. I'm currently in my third year studying in the Bachelor's of Science program in Global Research Systems at the University of British Columbia, uh, where I specialize in corporate sustainability and the Pacific Rim region. Uh, my passion first started in climate action when I noticed this large amount of immigrants that come to Canada but are not educated in environmental issues. And with climate change, a lot of the time is the most marginalized groups would be impacted uh, within you know, the climate crisis. And so I kind of, I was really inspired on finding ways to be involved with the city and educate new immigrants on different sustainability issues. 
and in 2019, I, I led my city's first ever climate strike. And so um, feel free to ask me about environmental education, uh, sustainability within the student union, where I'm currently the AVP sustainability for my university student union, or just completing a uh, uh, sustainability degree uh, in university as well. Awesome. And I will take a moment actually to ask a follow up question because that last point you made was very interesting. Um, you know, you do a lot of work around, um, you know, climate literacy with with immigrants. And so as you know, we see more of this climate crisis um, occur, I mean, we'll have, you know, more refugee crises, more people fleeing their country. So what are some of the strategies? Um, I know this is jumping a little bit ahead, but I'd love to hear before I forget a little bit more of the strategies that you use to really engage the immigrant community. Mm -hmm. One of the one of my most favorite strategies is community engagement here in uh, I grew up in the city of Richmond, which is just to the south of Vancouver, and we have a lot of public events uh, every single month. So some of these examples could be a Canada Day Parade we have every year. We also have a salmon festival that we host every year. So we have these different festivals uh, every every month. And pretty much what we do, what I did as a volunteer with the city of Richmond was I led uh, different high school volunteers in doing waste diversion campaigns where we'd have the um, at home waste diversion bins that you know the residents would have in their regular homes and we would educate the um, new immigrants or any community members that come to us with their trash and we would be like oh that goes to compost that goes to the recyclables that gave really gave a um, really one-on-one -on -one in person connection with us as the residents and we were able to answer any questions they have some people wanted to you know find ways to recycle their batteries which is not currently something that's provided within the city. So we were able to consult with different community members and kind of give them hands-on learning opportunities uh, throughout something that's very fun, like uh, the festival that we host in our city. So I think in those passive ways, we're able to really educate and really involve residents in voicing their opinions on what works and what doesn't for them. Definitely. And it really is a grassroots uh, movement. And, you know, as individuals who are working, you know, in grassroots projects, how do you see your work um, complementing or maybe contrasting some of the wider um, goals, like, you know, with COP26, Par uh, the Paris Agreement and other large climate crisis um, pledges? Do you see it, you know, do you see your work complementing it, contrasting it, maybe a little bit more ahead? Um, just, I would like to get an idea of what you guys think about that. So feel anyone feel free to jump in. Uh, the UN Sustainable Goals, they, they are being interconnected and, you know, they, uh, what we do are aligning through the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. What I'm feeling is the individual human change is going to impact the whole social change. That's why the change should start from the individual. Then what we can do is we can push the government and the, we, we are having the political leaders now. Uh, the young generation are raised, start raising a voice against the global leaders. You know, like we, sh we should start it from ourselves because the past generation like have gave the key of the action to us, to our generation. Like what we want to do is just do the basic advocacy and just push, push the leaders to like make some policies and make some changes. Do you think enough is being done at the global level um, to address these issues? Honest right. thought, it's a safe space. Uh, to, to be honest, uh, you know, it's happening like uh, compared to the past, you know, the global leaders have started understanding about the problems, uh, but uh, they want to understand more and they have to work more. That's my point, yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think understanding is very key. Um, and like I mentioned earlier um, in my intro is, you know, we have to have very effective messaging if we want to bring a wider audience. And um, along those lines, I know this question was in, in our initial thoughts, but uh, Madeline, I'd be really interested to know more about that, you know, the unique storytelling and, and you know, climate action through language um, and art. And I know that's something that we don't conventionally see. So I'd love to hear more about that work as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that a big challenge that we face a lot with climate change communication is how easily polarizing things can become, how politicized buzzwords can, you know, further entrench people in belief systems. I'm calling from Nashville, Tennessee. I personally know a lot of people who don't think climate change is real. So I'm sort of always looking for ways that we can unite on some common ground and talk about things that 
we all care about. Um, maybe it's clean air, maybe it's uh, access to water in a community that someone lives near. Um, but I think stories and art and that sort of unconventional storytelling can get people to connect on an emotional level that circumvents those like psychological barriers that come up in a very political politicized conversation. Definitely. I agree. You have to speak the message. You have to know your audience, right, to be able to speak the message. Um, and I think one thing that, I, that I've noticed, you know, even though you're all working in different subcategories um, of the environmental field, it's so obvious that each one of you is determined and confident in the work that you're doing. Um, but I think one thing that would be, you know, really uh, interesting for the audience to hear, especially the younger generation is, have there ever been moments when you feel a little bit of that imposter syndrome, like, you know, where you feel too young, or, you know, maybe you feel like you're not smart enough or not, uh, your opinion is invaluable enough to engage in these discussions? Have, has there ever been moments like that? And what have you done to, to overcome that? I can Anybody? speak to this. Um, well, I know from my experience, there wasn't a lot of talk specifically that was going around uh, about plastic in the ocean and how it's affecting the environment. Um, and from my high school, we had a marine science class that I was able to take. And through that, we did various projects. There was a, a the agricultural exhibition that we have in Bermuda. And my class did a whole poster board presentation on um, plastics and T basically telling people how, yes, plastic is used this way, but where is it really going? And I think it um, brought to people's attention that it's a problem that nobody um, usually talks about or that you don't really hear about. And I know from experience, there's certain fields um, that deal with plastics in the ocean and um, it's mainly adults. You don't see people that are younger, uh, high school age, college age students that are engaging in these things because they don't think that they have the right tools or they don't think that what they have to say is valuable because they don't have the experience on it. Um, I just know from my experience, uh, you may think that you don't have the right tool, but you your opinion is valued and it does mean something, especially when it has to deal with something that's drastically changing our environment. 100% agreed. I think there's also been moments, you know, in, in my short career, um, where having a different opinion is a good thing. You know, you bring something unique. And I think sometimes we can think of that as, as a negative, but really bringing that diverse um, uh, perspective is really important in this field. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's, um, it's a, sometimes a difficult thing to talk about, but, um, you know, one other thing that I like to touch on before we get into more specific questions is, um, we hear a lot of, you know, doomsday news on climate change and, um, and, you know, just not, doesn't seem very optimistic sometimes. How, um, and I like to hear from each one of you, how um, do you combat that climate fatigue and bring that optimism every day, or maybe not every day, um, to your jobs and to the work that you're doing? So um, I think this is something that we, we can all use a little bit encourage, encouragement from sometimes. So um, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. And anyone can jump in ahead or again, I can call on someone, but I would like to hear from, from each one of you since I know we're all coming from very different perspectives. Jason, you wanna go first? <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, I'm very grateful to be able to be surrounded by a community of other students that are also very passionate. And so their drive every time I feel down really up brings me and uplifts me into becoming better. So if you ever feel lost, if you ever feel lonely, I recommend you know, finding a community within, you know, your local city or your school or a, a local club that you can rely on each other on because, you know, being climate issues, climate change and the actions that we'll be taking is not an individual action, it's a collective action. And so um, in those times when I'm, I feel scared or I feel stressed because of um, climate change, I always rely on other people and 
um, usually we're able to work together and I, I would bring new solutions to the projects that I'm currently working on. So I would recommend reaching out, find your community and tackle issues together, not alone. Uh, Mr. Njivan, do you want to go next? Yeah, uh, let me share my story. Like uh, the, uh, the biggest uh, problem that I face in my community is the social stress. Uh, that and if I'm working for the climate change or the environmental thing, everyone will ask, you know, how we are going to earn through this, and uh, you know, we, uh, however, we are we are not going to get the social reputation in the global south because they only focus on some certain jobs and they are giving social reputation for those jobs. Like you are go not going to get that social reputation. You are not going to earn money, much money from this this area. Then why you are doing this? This question I frequently uh, I I always listen to these questions, but which keeps me alive and which keep me uh, you know move forward in this this work is uh, the people who are working behind me. Some of the people got inspired towards me and they are working for the ocean in the marine conservation and climate change. They are working, you know. I think that drive me to work in this field, and um, um, I, I got this unique idea because the God gave this opportunity for myself to work towards the environment. I'm not only working for myself; I'm working for you, for 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 the mother nature, and for for all. I'm 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 not uh, earning money, and I'm I'm not doing this stuff for me. That keeps me alive and drive me in this field. No, that, that's the thing. That's amazing. Thank you. Brianna or Madeline, do you want to go next? I love what everyone is saying. I think for me, something that's key is prioritizing joy on the day. Um, I think it's easy to fall into like the violence of the machine metaphor, like maximize efficiency, burn yourself out. You get an eye twitch two weeks in um, and it just doesn't work. And moving more towards being effective um, you know, whether that's closing your computer to find time to like put your bare feet on the ground or like talk with your friends, um, just reconnecting to the things we're all fighting for, you know, the people and places we love and the ideals we hold dear. Oh, green. Brianna, any other thoughts? Um, I would just say how I deal with the fatigue of it all, uh, like Jason, had mentioned earlier having that support system around you I know my support system I would be nothing without my support system um and when I am having troubles or when I'm stressed knowing that they're behind me like okay yes this is daunting yes this can be hard but you can you can push through it you can get past it it's really helpful especially on the days where I'm like totally not to ha don't want to do anything I'm kind of burnt out like Madeline was saying how to avoid not doing that um it's really helpful knowing that I have them behind me and helping me achieve what I set out to do 100% agree with all of you and I think at the core of every one of your messages really I'm um, sticking to your purpose right we've all been called um, we've all been given a purpose and knowledge and, and, you know, just tools to be able to, to work in this field. And I find that I, I always try to go back to that myself. Um, and when I think of climate fatigue, I think of like, well, I'm pretty sure there's people that are tired of breathing dirty air. I'm pretty sure there's people also tired of, you know, uh, not having clean water, et cetera. And so I try to keep in perspective as well um, my purpose and the privilege that I have to be able to be working in this field. And another theme that I think I, I've noticed just throughout your responses is that everything is interconnected. You know, again, we've all been work, you know, we all work in sort of different fields, but at the end of the day, the work that, you know, you do in Sri Lanka, the work that we do here in California, the work that you do in Canada, all come together and they all matter. Um, and it really is a testament to how much we'll have to be working together as we fight, you know, against um, air pollution and climate change. So um, I think that's something that can be inspiring because even though we're, you know, in different areas of the world, um, the work that we do at the individual level in different parts really does matter. 
Um, and I think um, now I'll go into more of the specific questions that our panelists have created for each other. Um, you know, that we've all been, they've all read each other's backgrounds. And so um, I'll ask some of the more targeted questions um, to each one of them. So I'll start with uh, Maddie. I know that, you know, like you mentioned, you've been working um, with Blue Energy to unlock um, access to renewable energy, to safe water, sanitation, hygiene, and you know these things that should just be this should just be rights. You know, human rights, the right to to clean air, to clean water, um, but that in so many parts of the world are still not accessible, even in countries like the United States. You know, the richest country in the world. So um, this is obviously not a simple answer, but. Um, what do you think is most needed to ensure that you know all of these climate policies and all these initiatives are created with like equity at the core? You know that it's not like a added category at the end; that it's really centered around that. No, you're exactly right. Um, all climate policy has to be created through the lens of climate justice. I think ensuring that at least has to include. Um, not only giving those who are most impacted by the problem, you know, the climate crisis, and thereby those who have likely contributed least to global warming, uh, a seat at the decision-making table, but also meaningfully deferring to the local knowledge of those who have long traditions of environmental stewardship of the land and of the water of this planet, and, you know, there's, there's really carefully considered environmental justice frameworks, you know, put forth at the local level, especially. And I think climate change policymakers have to take these seriously. 100% agreed. And I'll, you know, I'm inter interested to see, you know, what, how the negotiations end up after COP26 and just really um, see, the, you know, the work that will come um, as a result of that. Um, so yeah, we'll, you know, we'll be standing by to, to learn more about that. Um, and, you know, as we've mentioned a lot of times now, you know, equity has to be at the core of things. And um, even when we think of, you know, corporate sustainability and big businesses creating plans to, um, to be more responsible, to be more green, you know, um, how it's really just important. How do we, how do we address that and make sure that they're just, you know, they're not just greenwashing or, or making pledges that aren't really enforceable. And so for that question, I'm going to turn to Jason. And what do you think is, um, we know one of the most important things in a corporate sustainability program. Um, and what are some of the challenges that are perhaps preventing that? Obviously money being probably the main one, um, you know, the bottom line, but are there solutions to combating this sort of greenwashing? And just, you know, you're, you're a young professional studying in this field, just what is your vision for, for corporate sustainability? And just, I would just love to get your general thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So for corporate sustainability, I think one really key aspect of this program is intersectionality. And that's something that you touched a little bit about earlier. Um, there's not one degree in the field of sustainability that is more important than the other. You need a field of skills. You need a, field, field, um, a range of experiences to really help support sustainability and support making sure that everything and no one's left behind. So for my role specifically, Associate Vice President of Sustainability for my student union, I do different things of various degrees. So I work on marketing projects. I have to touch a little bit about civil engineering and uh, reporting standards. I need to work on supply chain audits. So I, usually those things are done by one degree, but because my field, you know, even though it is sustainability, I have to kind of pitch in and reach into my toolbox to see different skills. So um, in a corporate sustainability standard, I would recommend people just to expand their skills, making sure that they don't, you know, focus on one thing too much, focus on, you know, building your policy analysis skills, coding, all those really skills really play a really, really big part in uh, building my degree. And so uh, that would be my answer to the first question that intersectionality is super important for a corporate sustainability program. In terms of greenwashing, it's something that has happened for um, a long time now. And I think one of the biggest solution that you can do at an individual level is personal advocacy you know, being educated of yourself, of your everyday actions and kind of auditing every step of your day that you take. For example, the water that you drink or mm -hmm. the phone that you use, kind of knowing that where it's coming from or the supply chain of the time where it's created until the time it's in your hand. That's very important in making mindful decisions and choosing what to purchase. Um, I would recommend taking a look at different reporting standards like 
the B Corp certification standards or 1% or the planet, those companies that are certified in these areas put a lot of effort and a lot of time and money to make sure that, you know, what they're, what they're making like a net positive impact on the planet and that they're able to, you know, supply different items for consumers, but also um, not negatively impact our planet as well. Uh, for those who are interested in fashion, I also recommend a website called Good On You. They kind of audit different uh, fashion brands to see how sustainable they are. They kind of give recommendations on people, planet, and also uh, pricing as well, making sure that it's accessible and equitable for everybody as well. So I would definitely recommend taking a look at different reporting standards and brands and making informed choices and educating yourself. And that's the best way to target greenwashing. A hundred percent agree. And I know that, you know, we as consumers hold the power, you know, what we ask businesses to, to do our, you know, our money talks, um, where, where we choose to spend it, you know, where we choose to, to invest says a lot. So I definitely agree that we hold as consumers, a lot of power to, to be able to um, make, you know, those changes in corporate sustainability as well. And speaking of sustainability, um, Brianna, I know that you've been involved, you know, in sustainability at different levels of, of your award. Um, how has this helped shape, you know, the work that you're doing in marine biology? Um, and, you know, how, you know, how has it helped you? How has outside of the classroom helped you inside of the classroom? Yeah, uh, great question. I would have to say that through just education and then also personal interest, um, that I have with sustainability. Um, I've used, I know with, through the award, we've looked at different ways um, to reduce waste when it comes to uh, the group's adventurous journeys. And when they prepare their meals, we've looked at ways that um, we can reduce the waste of the packaging and uh, just the food in general. Um, I know also I'm taking a sustainability class right now. So um, we're looking at different ways that us as consumers can be more aware, like Jason was saying, of what we're buying um, and just being mindful of what we're consuming and what we're um purchasing how it can affect the environment in the long term um also with the my marine biology aspect of it we've looked a lot at again the microplastics and how it affects the north atlantic gyre um i've been fortunate enough to go to the bahamas to cape eleuthera to the island school um, where we looked at restoration of corals because there was a com completely dead reef that they're trying to restore. And we did work on that as well. So I would say that it's a factor of my interest in it, but also um, the my studies as well that have helped me to apply what I've done outside of the classroom into it. It just helps make the connection a little bit more clear. Yeah, 100%, you know, true. Um, you can, we can learn all this knowledge from books, but it's not really until we're out, out there experiencing it that, you know, we really put it into practice. Um, and, you know, I know, Shanjiman, we haven't asked you a targeted question yet, but I kind of asked you a little bit of it half of it in the initial part of this conversation. Um, so I know you talked about, you know, how the UN, you know, sustainability development goals are, are developing. Um, but a follow-up that I'd want to ask is, do you, how is this work um, involving Gen Z and millennials, if it is so? Um, and how would you continue to, to explore that? And how, how we, could we increase um, the engagement of younger people? Uh, in case of millennial and Gen Z, uh like my grandparents you know they born they lived they die you know they, they don't know they don't know they don't have the awareness about this climate crisis they don't know anything but my parents what they their generation what they did was 
they started thinking, okay, they, they, are, they, they, they are having the understanding of the problem. And they started doing the research and they found here is a huge problem. This is going to be a biggest disaster in the future. They found that problem. And now for our generation, they are giving the key of action, millennial and the gens. We are the people who wants to work in the field because we are going to be the future. Uh, that's why we are having a very big responsibility, but uh, the younger generation, they are, they are doing some great jobs. You know, you can see like, uh, we, we are questioning the world leaders to push them to work towards this climate crisis and the things. You know, we are not only doing advocacy in, in technology stewardship, building communities, we are different, working in uh, different aspects uh, towards this climate crisis. As a youth activist, what uh, for for a young person, what I can tell is, first, try to understand the problem first. Why why we should do this? Why why we should oh you know work against this a climate crisis? Try to like connect a local problem, then you know start speaking with the small community with your friends or family. Like start speaking about this thing then it will grow. This is how I started, now I'm being here. Like that's how you can start with a small circle, then you can create a big impact. You know, the, uh, the individual change is the social change. That's, that's what I believe. A hundred percent agreed. Um, and just, you know, like you said, that generational change and um, learning from past generations, passing that on. I know for me, mentorship has been very, um, important and i just like to give a shout out to senator fran pavley who's on actually on the call and she, i've been able to work with her over the last four years and she's really you know um the mother of climate policies in california she was the author of the global warming solutions act which became you know a, a model legislation for the rest of the world so um i i know that it's really important to be able to learn from people and really um translate that knowledge to future generations so hi fran um and before we go on to the q a part i think um it would be great to just wrap up this part of the discussion with you know just going back to the award you know the award has given so many opportunities um, for so many people. And so Jason and Brianna, what advice would you give to students that are, you know, going through the award process right now that might, you know, want to uh, just learn more about sustainability, you know, um, get into that field or, or, or earn their award through that? I'll go first and I'll pass it off to Brianna, but you can definitely incorporate sustainability in all aspects of your award. I did my bronze, silver, and gold. And so um, throughout the time, even though some actions might not seem sustainably specific, specifically, there's a ways where you can incorporate. So for example, for your volunteer portion, volunteer for organizations working on one of the UN sustainable development goals. This could be a food bank. This could be your local library, you know, targeting ways to incorporate sustainability that way for your skills um one of the skills you can do is like knitting or artsy craft trying to reuse materials or learn how to code which is something that's also really fun and also really pressing in the sustainability field as well uh, for sports i did dragon boating so one of the challenges i put for myself is that every time i go on a dragon boat trip with my team we would pick up uh, one trash bag full of trash to make sure that we leave the oceans better than we found it you can also try something called plogging Plogging is kind of a mixture of picking up trash and jogging. So you're just jogging around your neighborhood while picking up trash. It's another really great sport you can try out. For my adventurous journey specifically, um, for my silver, one of the coolest uh, aspects of it, we hiked to a uh, local forest and we uh, identified a invasive species location city. So what we did is we hiked to the location, we camped, set up camp near the invasive species um, area, and we pretty much spent the day just digging up the invasive species and working with the cities to clear up that area uh, that has been negatively affecting that uh, area of the, of the forest. So, you know, finding those ways, uh, making sure that you are aware of all the actions and all the possibilities you can take. I think that's one of the biggest um, ways that you can consider doing your award. Thank you, Jason. Brianna, do you have any other thoughts to add to that? Yeah, I would just really say that it's such a broad thing to look at, um, but finding that one thing 
that clicks in your brain is really helpful as well. Um, I know for me, uh, through my bronze, silver, and gold, I looked at, we looked at uh, trash uh, in bronze, and we basically walked the length of Bermuda and picked up trash <laughs> along the way. And we're looking at how some parks had more trash than others and how that was probably due to there was more trash cans in this place, less trash cans in this place. Um, and then for my silver, we looked at the microplastics. We actually were on a tall ship, the Spirit of Bermuda, and we sailed around Bermuda and had a, I think it's a trough is what it's called, and um, used that to collect as much microplastic as we could. And it was, it's really interesting to see firsthand because you hear about it, but when you take a look into the net and see all the very, very small pieces of plastic that are floating in the ocean, it makes it so much more real. Um, and then I know also through my silver, through Water Start, I did similar to what Jason did, the invasive species. Um, we went out to Burt's Island and started taking up everything, all of the invasive species that we could possibly find. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, for my gold, we went to, I went to the Bahamas through the uh, cask. So it's uh, all the other Caribbean islands come together uh, to do the gold. And for our residential, there was different aspects of what we could do, but my group, we went to a wetland and were basically clearing out the entire wetland so that um, locals, but not uh, locals and also uh, animals could have access to that area because it was completely blocked off. Nobody could reach it. Um, so that was, really what made it stick for me is that hearing it is one thing but seeing it out in the real world makes it that much more real a hundred percent agree and I think yeah my just you know five cents of advice would be just to go for all the young people watching this just to go out and, and try test different areas that you might be interested in and I think um, one of the cool things is that you know green skills will now be needed in all jobs, in all areas. And so um, we're not limited to just like a very narrow, um, you know, category of jobs. And so I think the earlier you can start gaining these skills and, and working in the areas that you might be interested in, I think that will really help off, help and pay off um, long-term in your career. So um, I think this is a great uh, part to just pause and go on to some Q&A questions from the audience that I know um, they're very eager to hear a little bit more about you. Um, so uh, I'll ask, um, there's actually one question for Brianna. Brianna, you're on the hot seat today. Um, it's Brianna, can you discuss the work with the internships at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science and how the climate impacts this type of work in the ocean ecosystem and how the climate impacts this type of work and the ocean ecosystem around the island. I can repeat it for you again, if you'd like. No, it's okay. <laughs> I, just, I just know who the question's from. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science, there's basically a Bermuda program internship that I was a part of um, where we looked at different corals and uh, we were basically looking at how putting them under stress in certain environments um, plays a role into their growth and their overall um, sustainability. Uh, so we looked at how when putting them in different light or putting them um, in a dark space for a while, how that impacted their growth. But then uh, from, sorry, from those analysis, we were able to see how different aspects of the reef where we got them from 
how that was affecting them, them as well. So if there was uh, some coral that were up higher in the ocean, they were getting more light, which means they were getting more nutrients, they were growing faster versus the ones that were closer to the bottom. So th through doing those experiments, we were basically able to um, take small pieces and replace them and put them back onto the reef in suitable environments to in basically improve their growth. That sounds very interesting. And I wish I had <laughs> more time to dive into that. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much for sharing more about that. Um, going back to the more general picture, will the actions, this is just a, a general question to whomever wants to answer, will the actions we take today be enough to foresaw the direct impacts of climate change? Or is it, you know, too little too late? I think we sort of touched on this as well, but I'd love to hear any any other thoughts. Anybody wants to anybody that wants to take a stab at it? I'm happy to to share a little bit about that as well. I know that you know again we've all been working in different different fields and um, different subcategories, but um, I mean I truly believe, um, and I'll I'll speak you know, kind of wrapping it up as well, um, that the change we make at the micro level really does make, a, you know, lead to macro change. And yes, what we do today can make a difference. And I want to make sure that everyone in the audience knows that and believes that, you know, that the work that we're doing um, can and will make an impact. And it's, it's again, about going back to the purpose, being persistent, and that willpower, um, you know, just being an example, calling on our leaders, um, on our government leaders, on our business leaders to make those change and really start from the bottom. Um, um, I have the privilege of working with Governor Schwarzenegger. And one of the great things that he, you know, I, I always hear him say is that every great movement began with people power, you know, whatever, whatever you can think of, it started with people going out to the front lines and, um, really pushing, pushing the line, calling our leaders to, to make the move. And I think that's something that we need to remember, because um, I know it can get a little bit of, of uh, too doom and gloom when we think of all of the news. But um, I want to encourage you all to continue the great work that you're doing, um, because we're, we'll get there. Um, another question from one of our audience member is, I'm a climate activist, but I'm finding it hard to get involved. Are there any resources that you would recommend? Jason or Madeline, do you have any, um, any, any suggestions? Sure, yeah. Uh, when I was in high school, I led my city's first climate strike and I had a lot of help from Fridays from the Future. So this was kind of um, the campaign and organization that started after uh, Greta Thunberg's kind of mm -hmm. initial first climate strikes. And so um, that really made a very big impact. We were on the local news, we were on the newspaper as well. Uh, we were also able to uh, advocate to a lot of city councilors to come abroad. Uh, we also had support from the school district, which was something that was not very common for other climate strikes after, you know, talking to different uh, groups across Canada. And so that also really helped in advocating for more uh, climate-based education in elementary schools and secondary schools. Because uh, one thing that we learned here in Vancouver is that one in 10 students will be going to the green economy, but we don't learn about climate change within our you know, curriculum. We don't learn about you know, sustainable waste diversion. We don't learn about you know, sustainable living practices. And so those are key skills that I personally believe that's very important for students to be educated on at an institutional level. So um, that was really great to see you know, different school districts and um, different key policymakers coming together to work on this. So definitely recommend reaching out to Fridays for the Future. They have a lot of great resources, posters that are already created. Um, reach out to your local um, uh, politicians. So in Canada, your local MLAs or your uh, senators. Uh, but I think that's a great way to start. And at the end of the day, even if you don't want to reach out, do it yourself. Find a, find a group of friends that you are interested in, you know, just as long as you're passionate, you can t you can go as far as you would like. So um, yeah, don't be scared and um, do it for yourself and do it for the community around you. Thank you. And Jason, actually, I have a, another question for you from the audience um, from HM for Dose. How do you think young entrepreneurs working with tackling climate change can influence world policymakers? 
That's a very good question. So for a lot of young entrepreneurs, when you're starting your own business, making uh, their sustainability throughout your supply chain and making sure that not only it's environmentally sustainable, but also in terms of a lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion as well, you know, kind of take a look at your website. How can you optimize it to making sure that, you know, people can access it as well as, as best as possible or your items of clothing or like product that you're supplying, making sure that that's uh, the everything that's supplied through the product that you're selling is also sustainable as well. So there's a lot of different steps that you can take. I recommend, again, uh, kind of going back to my first point of reporting standards, even though you, uh, as you know, as the entrepreneur you're starting off, those reporting standards are really great first initial base point to kind of figure out, you know, are you treating, um, you know, you, everything in your supply chain is as best as it can be. Uh, so that's kind of the initial steps I would take to make your business more sustainable but in terms of influence and policymaker. Yeah, reach out, don't be scared. Your MLAs are elected to support you. So if you have any questions for them, don't be scared to reach out. And I have been concerned to the community for everyone as well. I would recommend uh, advocating and uh, starting campaigns, working with your local community groups to really get uh, action going within your own community. Awesome. Well, this is a great place to wrap it up. Um, up. I do want to go through one quick lightning round to end on a positive and encouraging note. Just real quick, either how would you motivate young people to get involved or any last uh, you know, minute words of, of encouragement and inspiration? Um, just a quick one or two sentences. Sean Jivan, let's start with you. Yeah. Uh, the, the best way to get involved with the young people is uh, we should make them feel the problem. That's the first step we want to do. Uh, tr we should try to connect a local problem uh, with the young people. For example, if you are having a lake uh, in, in your backyard, then what you can do is if the climate changes, then the rain pattern is going to change. Then uh, the uh, re reproduction of the fish pattern that, that will collapse, then we are not going to have the fish in, in, our, in our lake then you know, we are not going to have enough uh, food for the people who are living next to the uh, lake and you know, the economy is going to go down and you know, we are not going to have fishes in, in the lake. You know, like this, we should make them feel, we should connect the climate crisis with the local problem. We should make them uh, feel the problem. Then what we can do is we should design problem, uh, this kind of, programs to the children and you know we should lead them you know then after if they feel the problem then they will lead the action lead to the action yeah. thank you madeline last words of encouragement or inspiration yeah of course um i think just that every degree matters it's not an all or nothing crisis um yeah, it makes a huge difference whether we're at 1.5 or 2 degrees. So your individual actions, how you pressure systems, your political work, uh, your activism, it's all really important. Whether you are a videographer, a scientist, an economist, a chef, uh, your skills are valuable and there's a place for you to get involved. 100% agree. Thank you. Um, Jason, any last words of encouragement or inspiration? Mm -hmm. I think definitely stay positive. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about climate fear and climate anxiety, and I just want everyone to be positive. This is something that's still um, able to be fixed if we work together. And so there's a lot of great work that's being done by young people that inspire me every single day. Uh, recently, I saw a cover of Olivia Rodrigo's Good For You, but with, you know, climate action <laughs> lyrics, and that was really fun as well. So uh, be involved. If you're passionate in art, you can definitely incorporate sustainability within your art. If you're passionate about music, there's also many different ways where you can pass uh, you can connect your own passion to climate action. So don't be scared. Stay positive, and we're in this together. Brianna, any final thoughts, words of encouragement, or inspiration? I would just say this is gonna sound really cheesy, but don't give up mm -hmm. because even though it might seem dark right now, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And there is a way that we can start to fix these problems. Yes, and I think, you know, we're facing an incredible challenge, but this challenge hasn't faced this generation yet, you know, or it is facing it now. So um, knowing that this next generation of leaders is bringing the power, the willpower and the knowledge that we haven't seen before to me is really inspiring and, and optimistic. And, um, you know, again, I've just been very encouraged by everyone's thoughts. 
Um, I want to repeat that what we do at the individual level really does matter and will make make a change. I know sometimes we can get really caught up with like the big ideas, big picture, COP26, Paris Agreement, but um, we hold a lot of power as individuals to do that as well. So um, thank you so much to our panelists for participating and sharing their thoughts. Um, and thank you also for to our audience for joining us. Uh, we want to hear more from you. So if you want to share, you know, what was something that inspired you today? How are you going to get, get engaged in climate action um, on social media? Use the hashtag spotlight session and share your thoughts with us um, through that. And again, thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll hope you will you'll join us at our next panel, which is young people and mental health. Um, please enjoy this final video as we depart and have a great rest of your day.